So I'm going to talk about um, the great ideas of computer science, which is a lovely title. And I'm sure if you had 10 different computer scientists, they would have 10 ideas of what are, what are the great ideas of computer science. I'm going to tell you what I think are the five great ideas that have made computer science what it is and that really will take us into the future. But I just wanted to begin by saying a few words about what we mean by computer science. So computer science is not the same thing as ICT. It's not about the technology. It's not about how the technology um, is used. It's not about how to create spreadsheets or write web pages and so on. It's not really even about programming, although programming is tremendously important and very interesting as well. It's really about the ideas that make computing possible. So I'm going to take you through five ideas which I think are the foundations of computer science. And the first of these is something called photolithography. Now photolithography has to do with how we make computers. So this is a picture of a dual core microprocessor and this one has several hundred million components. Now some of the parts of those components, those components are called transistors, and some of the parts of the transistor are now so small, they're just a few atoms across. And this whole thing is about one centimeter side to side. So it's one of the most complex and sophisticated things, perhaps the most sophisticated object ever built by humanity. And it's so cheap that even though your phone might have several of these, people like to sort of chuck their phone away every year and get a new one. So how can we produce something that's so sophisticated, so complex, and do it so cheaply? And the answer really goes back to the idea of the printing press. In effect, these circuits are printed. And I'll explain how that works by looking at just one of these components. So this is just a single transistor out of that giant microprocessor. And at the bottom, we have the silicon. And some layers have already been added. And what we're going to do is put another layer down, because these circuits are built up of 20 or 30 different layers. So let's see how we can add a layer of copper wiring. So you imagine this thing is um, minuscule, and yet it's, um, it's sitting on a, a wafer of silicon that might be 30 centimeters across. And we're going to make billions of these components all at the same time. So how is it done? Well, the surface is covered in a complete layer of copper. So a layer of copper is laid down across the whole surface and a layer of a special chemical is put on top and this chemical is sensitive to light. And then what we do is we project a pattern of light onto the surface of this wafer. The pattern being the same as the pattern of copper wiring that we want to produce. And that's easy to do because we can make a mask with, with the pattern and then shine light through the mask. And we can use that mask over and over again. So here is a pattern of light landing on this top surface. And that chemical, that green material, is sensitive to light. So the parts that were hit by light have been chemically changed. OK, the next thing we do is we wash this wafer in a chemical which dissolves away the parts of this top layer. We call this photoresist, this top layer that was not affected by light. So parts of it had dissolved away. The parts that were hit by light and have been chemically changed, they remain behind. So this material acts to protect the copper because in the next layer, we add in material, another chemical, which dissolves away the copper. So it dissolves away the copper, but only where this green material is missing. And then we've done that, we add yet another chemical and dissolve away the rest of that green material. And what we're left with is a pattern of copper wiring, exactly the same. We switch the lights back on. It's exactly the same as the pattern of light. But the point is, we don't just make one transistor. We make billions of transistors simultaneously. And I think this is possibly the greatest idea behind the computing revolution. Because the reason we're all here today, the reason Microsoft exists, the reason Microsoft Research exists, the reason we have these mobile phones and computers and so on, is because it's so cheap to mass produce these sophisticated electronic circuits. And that's all done through printing. So that's my first great idea of computer science, photolithography. Okay, 
My second great idea has to do not with hardware, but with software. And it's the idea of an algorithm. So I'll try to illustrate what an algorithm is with the help of volunteers. I need five keen volunteers, please. Yes, you were first. If you'd like to come up on stage and um, don't fall off the back or form a line of people. Who else is coming up? From, yes, you were next. Who's next? Yes. How many have I got? Three so far. Two more. Uh, did I hit see a hand over there? Yes, you can come on up. <laughs> one more. One more volunteer. Um, second in, not on the end, the next one. That's you, yes, come on up. Let's have a big hand for our volunteers. If you'd like to form a line down there. Let's go this way. What we're going to do is look at a very simple algorithm, um, which is an algorithm for sorting. So here's an algorithm for sorting. So we're going to sort these letters in, into their correct order. So the algorithm is just a sequence of instructions. So the first instruction will say, start with the item on the left. The second instruction says, take each item in turn, compare it with the next item to the right, and if they're not in the correct order, swap them. We then test to see if we're done. So, so step three is to ask, are the items now in the correct order? If they are, we're done. If they're not, we go back to set one and repeat it. OK, so let's try this then. So take the item on the left, that's the first step. Take each item in turn. Are these in the correct order? Yes, OK, good. These are in the correct order, so we do nothing. Are these in the correct order? No, so we're going to swap them. So what I want you to do is to swap places without falling off the back of the stage. Fantastic, all right. Next two items, are these in the correct order? No, so you swap. Last two, are these in the correct order? No, so you swap. Okay, so that's step two. Now we come to step three. We say, are these now in the correct order? No, they're not. So we go back to step one. Start with the item on the left. Are these in the correct order? No, so we swap. Are these in the correct order? Yes. Are these in the correct order? No, so we swap. Are these in the correct order? Yes. So we come to step three. Are they now all sorted? A, B, C, D. Yes, they are. And so we're finished. So that's an algorithm. So why is that one of my great ideas of computer science? Well, because this is what software mostly does. It runs algorithms. Software is just, as I'm sure you know, a sequence of instructions. So it might be millions of instructions rather than just three. But that's what the computer does. It slavishly follows instructions one after the other. It just does thousands of millions of these instructions per second. And that means that we're just sorting things. We can make a mobile phone or play games or have conversations over the internet and so on. OK, let's have a big hand for our volunteers. I'm going to head back. Thank you. We can head back. Thanks, Thank you. OK, so that's my second great idea of computer science. Here's the third idea, and this is really magical. It's the idea of cryptography. So what do you mean by this? So let's imagine that you're going to make an online purchase. You've gone to an online shop, and it's asking you to log in. So it's asking for your username, and it's asking for your password. And a bit later on, it's going to ask for your credit card details and all sorts of other information. So the question is, are you willing to type your personal information, your credit card details, into your computer and have those details sent to another computer? The computer, Amazon's computer, might be in California, for instance, and you're sitting in Cambridge. Who knows how it's going to get there? It's going to go through different countries, through hundreds of different computers. Anybody might be looking at that. Anybody might steal your credit card information on the way. You don't really know. We need some way of getting the information securely, some way of getting information from your computer to Amazon's computer, while we're confident that nobody can steal that information on the way. And this is the idea of cryptography. So if you look closely at this page, you'll see the address bar begins HTTPS. Now, HTTP is Hypertext Transfer Protocol. The S is a secure version. It means that your computer and Amazon's computer somehow set up a secure link so that, so that confidential information can go across that link without anybody stealing it. And there's even a nice little padlock symbol, give you a nice warm glow of security and comfort while you type in your personal information. So how does this work? Well, this is the idea of cryptography, the idea of a secret cipher, the idea we can scramble up information at one end, send it in encrypted form, and unscramble it at the other. So we'll see a simple example here of cryptography. 
Okay, this thing is called a one-time pad. It's not quite the same as the one that's used on the internet, usually, but um, it illustrates the idea. So the idea is the same for all of these. So everything in the digital world can be represented as ones and zeros. It's your credit card information, your password, photographs, music, everything is just a stream of ones and zeros. So imagine this is our message. This is your credit card number, for example, represented as ones and zeros. And I want to send that to somebody at the back of the hall in a way that you won't be able to, I want to you know, pass it down the rows to the back of the hall, and I want the person at the back of the hall to be able to understand this, but I don't want anybody on the way to be able to understand it. How is that going to work? What I'm going to do is to create a thing we call a key. It's called a key because it's a bit like a key and a lock in the physical world. We call it a key. And a key is just another number, another binary number. It's generated at random. So this is a random sequence of zeros and ones. Then what we do is we use the key to lock the message. And the way we do that is very simple. So we're going to create a scrambled message we call the cipher. And the, the algorithm, the procedure for doing this is very simple. We take the digits a pair at a time, the first digit from the message, the first digit from the key, and we create the first digit of the cipher. Now, if the digit of the message and the key are different, then the, um, the cipher digit will be a one. If they're the same, it will be a zero. You just apply that little recipe, so as we go along, so the next two, these are the same, so it'll be a zero. These are the same, so another zero. These are the same, a zero. These are different, so it'll be a one. Okay? So what we're doing is taking the digits of the message and either flipping them or not flipping them according to whether we have a zero, a one, or a zero in our key. So we've taken our message, we've scrambled it, we've made a cipher. Because the key was just random, this cipher is random. It contains no useful information. So on the way, if I send this cipher message to my friend at the back of the hall, all they will see is random ones and zeros. They'll have no idea what my credit card information is. Now, my friend at the back of the hall, or Amazon on the other side of the planet, can take that cipher and can use the key to unlock the message. And the algorithm for that is exactly the same one that we just applied. So let's unlock the cipher using the key. So these two digits are different, so that's a one. These are the same, it's a zero. These are different, it's a one. These are the same, it's a zero. These are different, it's a one. These are the same, it's a zero. So that's our unlocked message. And just to check, we bring up the message originally. It was one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. So we've seen how I can take a message, I can lock it using a digital key to make it random. I can send it to somebody at the back of the hall. They can unlock it with the same key. They can understand the message, but you guys on the way can't. So it seems as if the problem is solved, but it isn't. So why is this hard? It's hard because your computer has to agree the key with Amazon. Or to put it another way, people at the back, perhaps I've never met you before, but there's somebody at the back, and I'd like to communicate with them. So imagine I want to send a secret message to somebody at the back of the hall I've never met them before. We share no secrets. I've got to send them a secret message. The only way I can communicate with them is to stand on stage and talk to them in English. And yet I want to, I want to imagine a number in my head and I want them to know the same number. I don't want anybody else to know this number. But the only way I can communicate them, with them is standing on stage and talking and everybody can hear. So it sounds impossible. Because anything that person can hear, you can all hear. So how can I possibly send them a secret message without you getting the same message? It's obviously impossible. It's so obviously impossible that not that many years ago, there used to be people riding around on motorbikes with um, chained padlocks, uh, briefcases containing electronic keys for the, for the banks and the finance industry so that they could exchange secret information. It's obviously an impossible problem. Well, a few years ago, a few decades ago actually, some brilliant computer scientists discovered an ingenious solution, a way in which I can communicate with the person at the back of the hall, even though I've never met them before, even though you're listening to all our communications. How on earth does this work? So, we've got to get the key. I've got to get the key from my computer to Amazon. 
the cheap, stupid method <clears throat> would be I invent a key and I send the key over the internet. Now, that would obviously be stupid because everybody could intercept the key, so that doesn't work. <clears throat> An expensive but secure method would be to send a friend. I could write down the key on a piece of paper, get a trusted friend to deliver it to the back of the hall. Well, that would work in this hall, but imagine every time you want to buy a pair of pajamas on eBay, you had to fly your friend out to California with the keys, the electronic key, it wouldn't make sense. So the whole world of electronic commerce simply wouldn't exist unless we solved this problem. So we need a cheap but secure method of agreeing these keys. <clears throat> now, the solution is known as Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange, and it depends on some clever mathematics. But what's really nice is that we can explain that mathematics in a very precise analogy. And the analogy has to do with colors. So this is not a vague analogy. This is a precise representation of the mathematical process of key exchange, but using colors rather than numbers. So it depends upon a piece of mathematics called uh, a discrete logarithm. A discrete logarithm is an example of what we call a one-way function. Now, one-way functions are rather clever things. They're things which you can compute very quickly. You know, your laptop or your phone can compute one of these one-way functions in a tiny fraction of a second. It's very easy to compute. But to undo the function, to compute the inverse, is very hard. It would take your phone much, much longer than the age of the universe to compute the reverse process. So it's a piece of mathematics where you can compute it in one direction very quickly, but the reverse direction is extremely slow. It's just the same as mixing two colors. If I take blue paint and yellow paint and I mix them and I get green paint, I can mix them in a few seconds. If I give you the mixed paint and ask you to separate them, you could, you could look down a powerful microscope and you could separate all the molecules of blue dye from the molecules of yellow dye, and eventually, millions of years later, you'd have separated out the blue and the yellow. So it's a one-way function. So mixing colors is an example of a one-way process. So here's how this is gonna work then. We've got, you're over here, and this is Amazon, and you want to agree a secret number with Amazon, but somewhere on the internet is Dr. Evil, who's gonna listen to all of this communication going backwards and forwards. They're gonna copy every piece of information that goes backwards and forwards. And yet somehow, Amazon and you have to agree this number, and Dr. Evil has no idea what that number is. So each number is gonna be represented by a color. So different colors represent different numbers. Okay, remember a number, it could be a binary number, it could represent anything, music, videos, or a digital key. So we'll start with the first number, or the first color, which is blue. And blue is a sort of open, universal color. Everybody knows that blue is the sort of starting point. So Dr. Evil knows that it's blue. We all start with blue. Then what I do, or my laptop does, or your phone, is to generate a random number. So imagine this random number is represented by yellow. Now you can't send that number to Amazon because Dr. Evil will make a copy of it. We'll see it on the way. So instead what you do is you mix, in this case, the blue with the yellow to get green. So remember that's a very quick process to do, but it's very hard to undo. So we've got a mixture of blue and yellow, and that's now sent across the internet to Amazon, and of course Dr. Evil sees it going by and makes a copy. Okay, with me so far? Now, this is a symmetrical process, so Amazon, the Amazon computer, also generates a big random number. Let's say it's represented by red. But instead of sending the red across the internet, the red is mixed with the blue, so another one-way process. It produces this sort of purpley color, and it's that mixture that's sent across the internet. And once again, Dr. Evil sees it going by and makes a copy. Now, the final step then, on my laptop, on my computer, I mix my secret color, which is yellow, together with the color I received from Amazon. So this is now a mixture of yellow plus red from Amazon plus green. So the red and blue came from Amazon. I added yellow, so sorry, it's a mixture of red, yellow, and blue. So that brown splodge is a mixture of red, yellow, and blue. And that's gonna be our secret key. Now, can Amazon generate that same key? Well, yes, because Amazon has received this mixture of yellow and blue from me, 
So all, Am all the Amazon computer has to do is to mix that with red, and it will also have a mixture of red, yellow, and blue. So that's the same number that's on my computer. So we've agreed this secret key. But the final question is, can Dr. Evil also create that key? Well, it turns out that Dr. Evil can't, at least not without taking the age of the universe. These are the colors that Dr. Evil knows. What happens if you mix them? Well, you get a mixture of blue plus yellow plus blue plus red. It's got too much blue in it. Okay, it's red plus blue plus blue plus yellow. It's got too much blue in it, so it's a different color. And the only other thing that Dr. Evil can do is to try adding in some blue. Um, and that's now red plus yellow plus blue plus blue plus blue. It's got even too much blue, even, even more than before. So you see that no matter what Dr. Evil does, because Dr. Evil can't unmix colors, Dr. Evil can only mix colors, it's impossible for this person on the internet to recreate those keys. Now that, to me, is a brilliant, an intellectually brilliant solution. Because it's not done by mixing colors, it's done by computing these discrete logarithms, but it depends on that idea of a one-way function. So it's extraordinary, isn't it? There's somebody that's sitting at the back of the hall, I've never met them before, but I can stand on stage, I can explain the algorithm to them, I could stand up here and I could explain, in the next few hours, I'd explain what a discrete logarithm is, how it's computed, I could then generate my random number. They could generate their random number. We could exchange keys. You would hear everything that was going on. You would know the algorithm, and you would hear all our communications backwards and forwards. And yet, at the end of it, I would have a secret that I share with somebody at the back of the hall, even though I've never met them before. So to me, that's, that's an extraordinary result. And without that, we wouldn't have this tremendous world of of e-commerce or many of the other internet services that depend so much on having passwords and security. So that for me is one of the great ideas of computer science. Okay, my fourth idea is something that's very dear to my heart because this is my research field, it's the field of machine learning. So machine learning in the last few years has become arguably the most important and the most uh, rapidly advancing field of computer science. Essentially, for the last you know, five decades of the computing revolution, computers have been programmed. That is to say, to make a computer do something, like play music or take photographs, somebody writes an algorithm. We saw an algorithm earlier. Somebody writes a piece of software that tells the computer what to do step by step. And that's worked really well. We've achieved all sorts of amazing things with computers. There are a lot of things that we want to do that computers can't yet do. The sorts of things, in particular, the brain is very good at. You know, recognizing images, understanding there are people out there, recognizing individual people, understanding speech, translating from one language to another, creating text, all sorts of things that computers are very bad at. And they're very bad because we don't know how to program them. So machine learning is a very different approach. Machine learning, we don't program the computer to solve the problem. We do something very different. We program the computer to learn by experience. And then we teach the computer how to solve the problem. So machine learning is all about computers learning for themselves and improving over time without being programmed. This has become tremendously exciting. So it's a huge field, and I only have time to just sort of introduce you to this by just showing you one example. So there's an example of a computer that's going to learn something by seeing data. And this is um, a piece of software that's going to learn to, rec learn to recommend uh, films, movies. So what I've got on the screen is a couple of hundred um, very well-known movies. And the computer has been programmed to be able to take in recommendations, likes and dislikes that people have made about um, movies, and to use those to make recommendations for new movies. So in particular, this computer has taken in data from um, about 10,000 people where people have said, I like this particular movie, or I don't like that particular movie. Okay, so it's, it's looking at the patterns of likes and dislikes. People who like this movie tend to like this other movie, and so on. Now what it's going to do is it's going to learn about my preferences for movies. So it's had no data from me, but what we're going to see now is the computer actually learning about my preferences. So I have to give it some data. 
So all I'm going to do is give it examples. It's going to learn from those examples. So let's pick a movie, and let's suppose I like the movie. So what I'm going to do is drag the movie into the right-hand region, and that's telling the system, I've watched this movie, and I like this movie. So let's see what happens. OK, what's happening is all the other movies are rearranging themselves um, according to whether the computer thinks I will like them or not. Now, the vertical position on the screen is actually irrelevant. They're spread out vertically just so you can see them easily. What matters is the horizontal position. The horizontal position is the probability that I will like this new movie. So, if a movie is towards the right-hand side, if it's up against the green edge, the computer would be certain that I will like that movie. If it's right up against the red edge, it would be certain that I won't like that movie. If it's right down in the middle, it's 50-50. It doesn't know whether I'm going to like it or not. Now, what you'll notice is that most of these movies are clumped around the middle. Right? It's pretty unsure. There's one or two here. It's fairly confident I'll like these. But most of them, it's really pretty unsure. That's not surprising. The only thing it knows about me is I like this particular movie. So what it needs is more data. So let's give it another example. Let's give it another movie. And we'll say I don't like this movie, let's suppose. What you see is the movies are spreading out. They're moving to the left and right. It's becoming less uncertain about which movies I'll like and which I won't like. We call this machine learning. The computer is learning about my preferences for movies, not by being programmed, but by just by seeing examples. Okay, so in the same way, a computer can learn to recognize handwriting, to recognize faces, to translate language, and so on, just by seeing lots of examples. Let me carry on and give a little bit more data. Uh, let's just pick a couple more movies. Let's suppose I like this one. And uh, let's pick another one. Suppose I don't like this one. So it's now seen four, four pieces of data. And what you'll see now is that a lot of the movies are clustered down the right-hand side. It's very confident now. It's seen enough data. It's quite confident. I'm going to like the ones down the right-hand side. It's pretty confident that the ones down the left-hand side I won't like. And there are actually very few in the middle now. So this idea of the computer becoming less uncertain when it sees data. That's the modern idea of machine learning. The, the, the computer sees data from the world, and it learns something. It becomes less uncertain about the world. I'm just going to show you one last thing, because this is absolutely university-level stuff, um, but I can illustrate it with this demo, and it's just too good an opportunity to miss. So if you go off to university and you study physics or math or computer science or engineering or something, you'll come across the wonderful field of information theory. It was invented by somebody called Claude Shannon in the 1920s. And it's the difference between, it tells us the difference between data and information. So what's the difference between data and information? Well, I can illustrate that by um, considering these movies down the right-hand side. These are ones that the computer is very confident that I will like. So let's take one of these movies. And let's suppose I watch this movie. Let's suppose I like the movie. OK, so I'm going to drag it across to here. Now, remember, it's very confident that I will like the movie. So watch what happens when I let go of the mouse button. Watch what happens to the other movies. Watch carefully. OK, you saw that? It's just a, let me do that again. I'll pick another one. Here's one It's very confident that I'll like. So I'm going to tell it, yes, I like this movie. Watch the other movies. Tiny shift. It hardly made any difference. And that's what we expect. It was very confident that I would like the movie. So when I said, yes, I like the movie, it didn't learn anything. It didn't learn very much. In fact, Shannon defined, mathematically, he defined information as the degree of surprise. So there's very little surprise in that data, and therefore very little information. Let's take another one. So again, it's very confident that I'm going to like this movie, but let's suppose that I don't like the movie. OK, watch what happens when I let go of the mouse button. OK, very different effect. It was very surprising. It was very confident that I would like the movie, but I didn't. That was very surprising. So there was a lot of information in that data, and therefore it made a big change to its predictions. So in fact, the amount of information goes from zero at the right-hand side. It goes logarithmically to infinity on the left-hand side. But remember, each rating is one bit, one binary digit of data. So each rating contains the same amount of data. It takes the same amount of disk space to store that data. So that's the idea of data, ones and zeros on a disk, if you like. But the information content can be very, very different. So information and data are very different things. And if you study this at university, you'll find it's a, a fascinating field. 
Um, incidentally, this, this is just a little demo for, for use in lectures like this, but the software that powers this demo is the same software that powers the recommendation engine on Xbox Live. So if you use Xbox, um, it's recommending movies and um, music and games and so on. Um, that's all powered by that same software. So that brings me to my last, my fifth and last great idea of biology, uh, of, of, compu of computer science. Um, it's the idea that biology is doing computation. Now, this is not just a great idea of computer science. It's a, a great idea of biology. So um, the modern view of biology or the view of biology that's emerging is that biology, biological systems are processing information. That's the most fundamental view that's now emerging of biology. So these two fields, computer science and biology, which seem light years apart, are actually converging. Now, this is very early days. I'm sure, you know, during the course of the 21st century, we'll see extraordinary developments in this field in the same way that digital computers advance in extraordinary ways in the 20th century. But I'm just going to give you a little glimpse of what this is all about. So, and hopefully you recognize this. This is a little animation of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. This is the molecule which sits at the, inside the nucleus of every cell in your body, contains your genetic information. And it's this double helix consisting of these two strands. So if we, uh, we can represent this by a little picture here, we have one of the strands of DNA. It has this uh, sugar phosphate backbone, and then these bases. And there are four kinds of bases, uh, C, G, A, and T, cytosine, guanine, thymine, and adenine. And the order in which those bases occur codes information. Now, the DNA in your cells, in every cell of your body, that DNA has around 3,000 million of these bases. And it's what determines not just that you're a human being, but what color eyes and hair you have and so on. Now, DNA is this double helix. It has these two strands. And the other strand is a sort of mirror image of the first strand. So everywhere you have a G. Opposite a G, you always have a C and vice versa. Opposite the T, you have an A and vice versa. And so these are sort of mirror images of each other. And that's how DNA can be copied. So when the cells in your body divide, each one has to have a complete copy of your DNA. And that's done by splitting the DNA in half and making mirror copies of the two strands. So it's a molecule which is very well suited to replicating itself. Now, there's another little fact about DNA that I'm going to point out to you, and you'll see why in a moment. It turns out that these backbones have a direction to them, and they're actually in opposite directions. So, this video is, again, one of these sort of extraordinary things. This is a, a real-time computer animation of the replication of DNA. So, this is going on in the cells of your body right now. This is the DNA coming in on the left, the double helix. The helix is being untwisted and peeled apart into its two strands. Each of these little dots is an atom. So, what you're looking at is chemistry, biochemistry. But look at it. It looks like mechanical engineering. Right? This is like a machine. So it's somehow it's chemistry, it's biology, but it's mechanical engineering as well. So here's the strand being split in half. This strand is simply being copied, but the other strand is back to front. So what it has to do is pull out a loop and copy that loop backwards. So one strand can just be copied simply, but the other strand is back to front, remember? So it's being pulled out as a loop, and it's being copied. Here it's being copied in the reverse direction. So here's the loop being pulled out, it's being copied in the reverse direction in sections, which then break off, and then it makes another section, pulls out another loop, and when they join up, it breaks off, and so on. So that's extraordinary. That's the world of biology that we're just beginning to understand. So it's pretty obvious. I think Crick and Watson must have um, spotted this as soon as they discovered the structure of, of DNA, that it's, it's, it can be used for information storage. That's what it's all about. It's about information storage. In fact, I could represent C, G, A, and T by two-digit binary numbers, and then any um, binary sequence that I care to name could be represented as uh, DNA, and people have taken email addresses and so on and encoded them as DNA. So DNA is clearly a, a, a digital information storage system. Um, but it turns out that it's much more than that, as I'll explain in a moment. But first of all, let me comment on an idea called genetic, so-called genetic engineering. Genetic engineering has been around for a number of years. Um, here's an example. This is, these are leaves of the peanut plant, and they've been attacked by the larvae of the cornstalk borer, uh, which is obviously very bad news for the peanut plant. 
Okay, so it's, a, um, it's um, uh, done enormous damage to the peanut plant. So the idea of genetic engineering is the idea of taking a gene, that's a piece of DNA that codes for a single protein, taking it out of one organism and adding it to another organism. So in particular, um, there's a bacterium that can um, kill that larvae because it expresses a particular protein. People have found the gene that creates that protein. They've copied it and transplanted it in to the uh, peanut plant. So the peanut plant is identical in every respect, except that it makes this one additional protein, which, when the larvae eat that, they die. And so this is peanut, which has been exposed to the larvae. You can see a little larvae there. And the larvae have died, and the peanut survives. Now, that's called genetic engineering. And it's a very important field. But engineering sort of the wrong word. Because engineering, in engineering, we have components, we have designs, we can create things to our specification. This is not really engineering. This is just taking one piece of biology and transplanting it into a different piece of biology. And amazingly, it happens to work. So the goal of the field which I'm going to talk about now, computational biology, is in a sense much more ambitious than this traditional genetic engineering. So here's a piece of DNA, um, and it's this piece of DNA is called a gene. So this gene is a sequence of these bases, and it codes for a particular molecule, a protein. And part of this gene is called the coding region, and by a process called transcription, it's copied into another molecule called RNA, and then the RNA is turned into a protein in a, in a process called translation. So that's fundamentally what DNA does in your cell. It makes proteins. But it's not just a simple process, because the, the gene also has a regulatory region, something which controls how much protein is, is made, a lot, uh, some, or, or virtually none. And the RNA and the protein itself can influence the regulatory region and control how much protein is made, and not just its own gene, but other genes. So this process that's going on in, in your cells of DNA-making protein those proteins can interact with the creation of other proteins. There are lots and lots of loops and feedback. In fact, this is just a little piece of um, the biology going on inside living cells, just a tiny fraction of it. You see it's extremely complex. This is the network of interactions between different proteins. So we want to do engineering. What we want to be able to do is to effectively code in biology, program biology. Now, it's actually been proven, in fact, by a colleague of mine in, in Microsoft Research in Cambridge, that this system that operates in, in, the, in living cells is what we call Turing complete. That is to say, it is truly a computer. Anything which any other computer can do can be done by biology. So it's a general purpose computational substrate, if you like. But the question is, rather than just describe how an existing system operates, could we change the code? That is to say, could we devise a sequence of base pairs that would have a desired function, one that may not exist already in nature? And this is a subject, computational biology, which is absolutely at its dawn. We're taking the first tiny steps. And this is an illustration of pretty much the state of the art in this field. It's a little piece of computation that's been added to an organism called E. coli. And it's doing a very simple thing. It's going to detect, it's going to emit a signal, and it's going to detect that signal from other cells. And if it detects the signal, it will create a thing called green fluorescent protein. That's a protein which, when you shine ultraviolet light on, glows green, and so you can see it. And here's the, the computer code that this piece of biology is going to, to run. So we're going to take that code, we're going to turn it into DNA, add it to E. coli, and if it all works, the E. coli will uh, grow normally, except that in addition it will be doing this little piece of computation. Um, so this is a computer simulation done by colleagues of mine in, in Microsoft Research here in Cambridge, showing how that should behave. And on the left, you see a computer simulation of the growth of E. coli in a Petri dish. So this is a dish a few centimetres across. This is E. coli growing and communicating with each other via that signalling mechanism and then deciding via that little algorithm whether to create green fluorescent protein or not. And what you see is that according to the computer simulation, the green fluorescent protein should occur in the E. coli in a ring. Not everywhere, not in the middle, just in this ring. And on the right is a video, a fluorescence video taken by 
uh, Jim Hasselhoff and his colleagues in plant sciences at the University of Cambridge are collaborators showing real E. coli that have had this extra software added growing in the Petri dish over a period of time. So this is uh, sped up. And you see it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's forming that little green ring. So why are we doing this? Well, there are two reasons. The first is that biology is extremely complex. And the way to understand something that's very complex is to be able to create it yourself. So one of the motivations for doing this is to understand the enormous complexity of biology. There's also a very powerful and practical motivation. We want to be able to cure diseases. We want to be able to improve crops. We need to be able to deal with climate change. In the 21st century, sadly, and it's you know, a mess created by my generation, but one that you guys are going to have to help sort out, we have a lot of big challenges in the 21st century. But biology could help us address many of them. So just to give you one example of the ideas that people are working on, it's called the doctor in a cell. So one of the biggest killers is cancer. Cancer is not only very nasty, but it's something that we might be able to get an understanding of by viewing biology as computation. Cancer has to do with a breakdown of the computational processes happening within cells. So maybe there's a computational solution to the problem of cancer. So the idea is that we would create compute, computer programs but in biology that would run inside the cell they would detect when a cell becomes cancerous and they would trigger what we call cell death. That's a natural process by which a cell commits suicide. So the idea is instead of having to hit you with chemotherapy, which is very nasty and often doesn't work properly, instead, if a single cell becomes cancerous, it dies before it can spread. That's already been demonstrated in principle in the test tube. We are a long way from being able to do that in living organisms. But I wanted to end with this. This is my final um, great idea of computer science. I want to end with this because that little computer program, that's the state of the art, five lines. It's like the dawn of computing. It's like somebody who's just built a computer with four or five vowels, and they've just added two numbers together. Right? So this field is, is at that state today. And the 21st century is going to see this do things for humanity in the same way that I think conventional digital computing has done um, in the last five decades. So just to summarize, my ideas of the great ideas of computer science are the following five. Photolithography, whereby we can make billions of transistors all at the same time, very, very cheaply. Algorithms, the idea that a computer follows a sequence of steps, one after the other, and by doing thousands of millions of steps per second, the computer can perform all sorts of miracles. Cryptography, critical to the internet age. The idea that we can send secret information over the internet, even though people can intercept the messages on the way. Machine learning, one of the big frontiers of computer science, perhaps the biggest frontier today, where instead of programming computers to solve problems, we program them to learn for themselves. Then we teach them to solve those problems. That's opening up whole new possibilities. And then finally, a fledgling field in its infancy, viewing biology as computation. Okay, thank you very much.